Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today we're going to be talking about the linguist film, Arrival. But first, Lauren, what have you been up to these days? I am enjoying getting a fair amount of work done and published, which is a a rare and exciting feat in academia sometimes. So I have a a descriptive grammar of Yolmo, which is a language that I worked with for my PhD, and that's now available. I'm really excited because it's an open access book, which means that anyone can download it and read it for free. Yay! I'll put the link to that in the show notes for those who are in any way interested in the grammar of Tibetan dialects of languages spoken in Nepal. I know many of you are, but it's really, really exciting. (laughs) It's a bit niche. (laughs) Yeah. You've seen Arrival. Now read detailed descriptions of the distribution of ergativity. (laughs) No, that's been happening. And uh, I'm going to a conference called LDLT. So it's Language Documentation and Linguistic Theory in December at SOAS University, which is also the university I'm at. So no travel required conference, always a bonus. So if there's anything interesting to report there, I will report back. I look forward to hearing about it. What have you been up to? I have been working away in the background on my book about internet language and the future of English, which is something that occupies a lot of my time, but currently has nothing that I can share with people. So <laughs> yeah, so I'm trying to get the, the second draft done and into my editor. So it, you know, it's making progress. It's, uh, you know, taking shape to be a real book, which is exciting, Yay! but there's still a lot of editing ahead of me. I also just got back from EmojiCon, which was a conference about emoji, where I met some members of the Unicode Consortium, the shadowy committee that decides which emoji we have. I had a lot of conversations about what types of things should be represented and you know what the role of a technological standard is in implementing that. So I think that's really interesting because it's kind of the opposite of how dictionaries work. Like dictionaries are just playing catch up. You know, people decide to use words and then dictionaries just add them. Whereas for emoji, because they're a technological thing, the committee has to decide first based on sometimes shadowy evidence for whether or not an emoji is going to be desired by a lot of people. So that was very interesting. It's funny, occasionally at the moment I message someone and I'm just like, oh, I wish there was an emoji for this thing. It would be really handy right now. So all I have to do is lobby the Unicode consortium, apparently. Yeah, you can write a proposal. You make like a PDF document that has the reasons and some kind of Google Trends data to see try to provide some sort of justification for whether people are searching for it or whether people are tagging stuff with that on Instagram or something like whether it's a concept that's being used because I mean obviously if it's just something very obscure they're gonna say no. Hmm. So if you ever want to write an emoji proposal I can point you to where to do that. There you go I learned a thing today. Shall we talk about Arrival? Yes. I mean, I feel like I've been talking about nothing else, but maybe people who aren't linguists haven't been quite as excited as linguist internet has been about the film Arrival. Yeah, the linguist internet has been very exciting about it, but I also have the linguist who consulted for Arrival on my Facebook, so I've been seeing all her posts about it. Not only do you have her on your Facebook, but she was like your teacher, right? Yeah, she was my advisor in grad school. I worked with her on my thesis. That is amazing. So for people who don't know what the film Arrival is about, you saw it slightly more recently than me, Gretchen. So it's, you know, a week fresher in your brain. So Amy Adams plays a linguistics professor and the linguistics professor gets called upon to aliens arrive. Sorry, aliens arrive. And nobody can talk with them. I love that you start with the linguistics professor. There's a linguistics professor. Yeah, I start with the linguistics professor because that's clearly the most important part. There are also aliens and no one can communicate with them because they're aliens. And we don't have a universal translator because that's not a real thing, guys. And so the military comes knocking on her door and says, hey, can you figure out how to talk to these aliens for us? And she's like, uh, yeah, I guess. Okay. And uh, she goes and like tries to figure out, you know, what they have in common and what they can talk about and kind of builds up from basic words into more complicated stuff that she can finally ask them, what is their purpose on Earth? What are they doing here? And then like stuff happens. I think this is going to be a spoilery review because the movie's been out long enough. We're not doing this so shortly afterwards that people are listening to this. They've had plenty of opportunity to see the film or press pause right now and come back. So press pause, go watch the film, come back when you have seen it. So the reason that this film has endeared itself to linguists and the general word nerd community 
is that it is a relatively authentic representation of the kind of steps you need to go through when you find yourself having to communicate with someone who you have no language or communication system in common with. And I think that's why it's been so appealing. And it's a really compelling part of the story as well, because it means that they don't fall back on this kind of juice ex machina, universal translator or interpreter or something like that. Trying to communicate is the major driving force behind the film. Yeah, and the process of trying to figure out a language when you have no language in common with the people who are speaking it is a real thing. It's called monolingual elicitation. Ken Hale, who is a former professor at MIT, is the best known person who's done that. He demonstrations for linguistic students about doing this. So it's a real thing that people have to do. And I've seen a monolingual fieldwork demonstration and you generally start with very concrete objects. You know, you pick up a stick or you pick up a rock or you gesture to yourself and you say your own name and, and this type of thing and body parts, you know, stuff that's around you can point to and you work on the assumption that the other person also wants to communicate and they also understand that communication is a thing and that words are a thing and that, you know, you're just trying to convey your intent that you want to try to learn their language. Language. And then you can start acting stuff out like I drop the stick or I'm walking, I'm falling. You don't necessarily know if they're giving you a word for walk or if they're giving you a word for go or if they're giving you a word for move. So you have to figure that out later, but you're at least getting some sort of verb and you can see kind of what the verbs do and stuff like that. So, you know, monolingual fieldwork is a real thing that people do with humans. And in theory, if we got in contact with aliens, that would be something we'd have to do. Yeah. We're lucky that they are embodied aliens, like they're aliens that have bodies and as far as we can tell those bodies belong to separate entities. Because if they were some kind of like hive mind yeah. who didn't realise that individual humans were communicating with them separately. Yeah, or if, as is more likely, we were making contact with them via radio waves or pulses of light or something like that and we didn't have bodies in common at all, that could be a lot more difficult. Yeah, so really, the fact that they turned up in giant spaceships is very convenient. Very convenient. To doing linguist-based fieldwork. And that the spaceship has a kind of like built-in whiteboard thing. It's like they knew. Yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> that was very helpful. <laughs> uh, thanks, aliens. Good job. I think actually in the short story, right, they just sent in like a television screen for the aliens. They didn't actually have the aliens physically there. Yeah, so some people may know this, but the film is based on a short story about essentially the same premise of aliens come to Earth and we have to learn to communicate with them. But there's something really beautifully mundane about the short story. So in the short, in the short story, 120 of these screens essentially appear across the Earth and pairs of aliens turn up to them and work with humans to kind of communicate. And instead of people being in kind of mass hysteria about it, which is a kind of driving tension in the film, everyone's actually just pretty chill. They're like, they go in, they work with the aliens, yeah. and then they go home at the end of the it's day. It's a lot calmer. There's less of this, like, tension music. So the short story is called The Story of Your Life, and it's by Ted Chiang. And it was published quite a long time ago, and the creators of this film spent a while trying to figure out how to get it made, because it's not a very Hall-like story. And so they did have to up the tension, which I think works well in the, the movie context, where you have people wondering if, you know, riots in the streets and, you know, people complaining about the governments and, you know, dramatic news reports and all of this stuff. But at the same time, I think that there's something very intimate about the short story. Yeah. So the movie itself, the director was Denis Villeneuve, who is a Montreal-based director. He's, he's from Montreal. His family's here. That's why they filmed it, y'all. Ah, I thought it was just because of that thing where Canada's cheap for Hollywood to shoot in. Uh, probably that too. I'm sure the tax breaks did help. But I, I think the reason why Montreal specifically was because, yeah, he like has family here. Huh. So they were filming in Montreal. I think some of the scenes at the university were filmed at Concordia. And when they filmed it in the summer of 2015, they got in touch with some professors at McGill University. I know they got in touch with several different professors. So Jessica Kuhn, who was the one that was my advisor, was the primary linguistic consultant for the film because she has done field work. She's kind of a similar age demographic to Amy Adams. So if you're going to like model <laughs> stuff <laughs> off her, I guess it makes sense. Jessica says they asked her what kind of bag she carries so that they could give Amy Adams a similar like laptop bag. And then they also worked with Morgan Sonderiger, who's also a prop at McGill, on some of the like audio visual stuff. So I think he's the one that's responsible for them using Pratt on the computer screens in the... Apparently it's not real Pratt, it's like fake oh. Pratt. 
So these are the kind of details that linguists get really excited about in this film. But when you pan over the computer screens that different analysts are using in dealing with these aliens, a lot of the software looks really familiar. And one of the pieces of software that linguists use to analyze spectrograms, which is the kind of visualization of sound patterns, is a program called Prat. It's adorable. It was like written in the 80s or 90s and it still looks like it today. It's a pretty old school looking program, but it works great. Every generation who was trained on computers to do phonetic analysis was trained with Prat. We have warm and fuzzy feelings towards it. So seeing something that looks very much like that piece of software on screen was nerd points plus. Yeah, so that was good. So I think he's responsible for that. And then when they were figuring out the office that Amy Adams' character would have in the movie, they wanted to look at real linguistics offices. And the story goes is that they went to Jessica's office and Jessica showed them around her office and they made a note that she had like a tea kettle and a cup of tea and they were like she can we can have tea for this prop which I, I think very authentic <laughs> a lot of linguists have tea in their offices but they also wanted an office that had like more stuff in it so Jessica took them upstairs to Lisa Travis's office and they looked around Lisa's office and they also took inspiration from that office and Lisa has been a prof for longer and she has more books around and she has more papers and more stuff in her office and so they rented some books from Jessica, but they also rented some books from Lisa because Jessica didn't have enough books. <laughs> I mean, there were a lot of books in that office. So they rented the books by the foot? By the foot? Yeah, they rented the books by the foot. And they really wanted to rent the blue and cream books that Lisa had. It was impressively uncluttered for an academic office. Yeah, I think they kind of struck a medium between Jessica's office and Lisa's office. Jessica's office is also very clean, very neat and, uh, and uncluttered. Right, okay. So I think they kind of struck a medium between there. But the way the shelves are formed looks a lot like McGill shelves. Right. So you feel very homely when you see that scene. Yeah. Ben Zimmer did a post on Language Log talking to Lisa and Jessica and Morgan about the office design decisions. So we can link to that in the description as well. Yep. Another thing that they put a lot of effort into was designing the language Heptapod B, which is the beautiful circular writing system. Someone said it looks like a coffee, the stain, coffee stain from a mug. And I haven't really been able to get that image out of my head. But that logographic writing system is actually a, it is a functional constructed script as far as I'm aware. It has pieces to it. Like it has different specific parts that mean specific things. And this was one of the other things that they got Jessica Kuhn to do is they sent her a bunch of printouts of this script and they said, go and analyze it we're not going to tell you anything <laughs> and so she kind of marked it up with what she thought different stuff might be doing try to figure out like what each part meant without any knowledge of what it was doing and they used that as some of the I don't know if they used the exact things that she had marked up herself or if they just used that as a basis for some of the annotations that Louise Banks as the linguist character would do in the film I read somewhere the guy who designed the script, his son got like really into it and it was his son who designed the analysis program that goes through and looks at the points and does science on it. So there were two things, right? There was the like artistic designer who designed the script and then there were the analyst people who did yep. the physics and the computer programs. Right. So I don't remember the name of the script designer, but I know it was like the production designer's wife or something and they keep referring to her as the wife and not with her name, which is annoying to me. So yeah. I don't know her name, but we'll try to link to her. She was a graphic designer who made the script. And then it was Wolfram, I think Stephen Wolfram and his son, who did the like math and physics -y side of, and they wrote an active computer program to analyze bits of the script and put it together. Yeah. So there's a moment in the film where she's trying to make a sentence and she picks, you know, the part that means human and the part that means arrive or something. Like she picks a you know, noun and a verb and something else. And she picks those bits and says, put these together. And it like smushes them together into a round circular thing on the screen which yeah. was a great computer program like I would love to have this program to do linguistic analysis with yeah it looked really pretty I love that um you know in 10 days of aliens arriving they can make better linguistic software than we've had in like 10 years of <laughs> and we're still using Prat we're still using Prat I'm gonna link to Prat in oh, the yeah, notes please do. just because the logo is amazing someone drew it in paint <laughs> like in the 90s I believe that. and it's just stayed that way it's pretty adorably hideous yeah so in the meantime the military has this like money to write a whole computer program in 10 days yeah. But yeah so one thing we've kind of not even touched on yet is the cornerstone of the emotional journey 
of the film, which is that in working with these aliens and figuring out their language and learning to use it, it changes the way Amy Adams's character perceives time. Time stops being a linear construction for her. Really, if you've got this far through the podcast, you deserve to have that plot point spoiled. If you haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it's, it's also in the short story. So yeah. I walked in already knowing it and I still got a lot out of the movie. So at the beginning of the film, we see kind of a short montage of her with a child, you know, having a baby and the child growing up and then the child ultimately dying at a quite a young age, I think around 11, of some, you know, terrible illness. And so I think people are supposed to assume that this has already happened before the events of the movie even start. Because we see her with a child, we don't see a father for the child, so we just see her and her daughter. And then as she starts decoding the alien language, she starts getting, we think are flashbacks, but in, in the end are actually flash forwards into her life with the child. And at the end, she makes the decision that like, yes, she's going to go ahead and get with this guy, even though she knows that it's going to end up in you know, divorce and separation and then ultimately the child dying. So she decides that the good points of that are worth the sad points. So that's something in terms of the emotional journey that is something quite different between the film and the short story. Because in the short story, she says very clearly, even though I knew exactly what was going to happen and how events were going to unfold, I felt completely uncompelled to... I mean, I guess it's the same in the short story in the film. But in the short story, it's not made clear that she and her husband get divorced because she tells him or he figures out that she knows something about the future. It's just how events go. You Sometimes when films dabble in that kind of stuff from a short story or, or a story you really like, you can feel a bit cheated. But I thought it was done really well. Yeah, I think emotionally it was done very well. It turned into a meditation on choice and free will and whether moments of joy worth the moments of suffering or if you had the chance to change your fate, would you? Yeah. I know he has a name, but I can only think of him as Hawkeye. So it's Louise Banks hooks up with Hawkeye. I think he's technically Jamie Rander, but we can keep calling him Hawkeye. Okay. Good. And the character is Ian. So Louise Banks hooks up with Ian, Amy Adams with Hawkeye. Hawkeye. <laughs> Um, I was expecting his character to be a lot more annoying because they kind of set him up as like the douchey scientist at the beginning and then he just became a foil for her to like say her ideas too and I was fine with that. It's really nice for a guy to be the ditzy eye candy. I'm completely okay with that. I don't really think of Jeremy Renner as eye candy but like okay yeah it was really nice to have the female character be like kind of compelling it wasn't that she was like sexualized she was just there and being a scientist. Okay, so there's this this one that I think is a big linguist quibble for the story where his character says to her character, you think of language like a mathematician. The thing that I found very unrealistic is that she does not say, um, yeah, obviously. Yeah, there were a few times where you just like, if she was a real linguist, she'd just be like, ah, uh, yes, of course. That is obviously what I do. You like, oh my god, seriously. This is literally what linguistics is. <laughs> but I get that, like, she wasn't supposed to be, like, a smart-mouthing, wise-cracking person. There's another moment in the film where she uses this analogy of the kangaroo story. So the military guy is saying, you know, why do we need to learn like basic verbs and nouns? Why can't we just ask them why are they here? And she's like, look, we have to build up to that and we have to be able to understand their response. Because when Captain Cook was arriving in Australia, he asked one of the Australians, you know, what is this? And the person said kangaroo, which turns out just means I don't know. So what I've heard is that this was a line in the script that Jessica Kuhn looked at and she's like, this story is false. But the producers were like, wow, we still want to have this story in because it makes this point really well. And so what they did is they added in a line where the military guy would leave and then physicist guy, he would be like, great story. And she'd be like, yeah, it's false. That turned into kind of a laugh line for the audience. Actually, it annoyed me because the line was, it's probably not true. And the actual reality is it's definitely not true. It was a language that wasn't spoken near Sydney. There's a long and now better documented history. Good. Yeah, so the original version of the script had her play that story straight as if it was true. And then it's because of Jessica as the linguist consultant that when she was like, this story is false, that they added in the second part. Excellent. She did a good job. And of course, just as I was feeling good and smug that they got that right, the military dude then turns around and says all this bullshit about like, I can't even remember what the line was, but I was so angry at the time. I think it was like they got wiped out by a superior race or they got nearly wiped out by a superior society or something like that. And oh, it's supposed yeah, yeah. to be an analogy to the maybe the aliens are coming to wipe out humanity, but it turns into saying that the colonizers were superior for wiping out the Australians and that's not a great thing. Yeah, did not, did not sit very well with me. I have had a few people, because I did talk about this on Twitter after I saw the film, and I had a few people be like, May, like maybe they did that, they did that knowingly, or 
but the black guy said it, which was definitely not my favorite suggestion for why it was okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, d- I don't think they did it knowingly, and that was quite an annoying line to toe. And I think you could make a similar point without making a line that's quite that bad. Yeah, like if she was a real linguist, she would definitely have gone to town on him for that yeah, line. Yeah, because real linguists care about, you know, the well-being of minority language communities and defend them. Yeah. So the non-linear time that Louise starts perceiving is, as we said, key to the plot and kind of the twist in the whole film. And that idea in the film and in the short story is inspired by something that people have been talking about in linguistics for quite a while now, and that's the theory of linguistic relativity. And the reason that the alien language causes her to perceive time differently is because it's written non-linearly. So the linguistic relativity, I think we agreed that it's a satisfying emotional journey. From a technical linguist standpoint, it just seems really, really unlikely that learning another language is going to completely alter your sense of what past and future is. But then again, this is a film about aliens. Yeah, and who knows, maybe there was some weird special mind-altering gas in the chamber and it wasn't really a linguistic influence, it turns out to be some neurotoxin influence. That's what I'm putting my money on. You want to really reanalyze that environment she was in. (laughs) Maybe it was a neurotoxin. Yeah, I mean, I think the film is trying to set up the point that it's the language because they talk about the Sapir Whorf hypothesis and they talk about this idea that the language can affect how you perceive the world. And so I think that's the point that the film is trying to make, but I don't think we as an audience have to believe that this is a real thing that happens any more than we believe in time travel paradoxes or have to plot aliens existing in the first place. Linguistic relativity is an entire field of academic inquiry and I don't want to reduce it to a pithy line. My feeling with it is the effects that we've seen that exist to suggest linguistic relativity is a thing are usually deeply embedded in culture and language acquisition and other factors that are hard to tease apart. And they often tend to be effects that can be negated through a small amount of metalinguistic awareness and a bit of training in a certain paradigm to kind of counteract and it can be quite subtle. One example of something that has been shown for weak versions of linguistic relativity is that if your language says that two particular shades are part of the same color, you'll tend to treat them similarly, whereas if you say that they're part of different colors, then you'll tend to treat them differently. So if your language that has different words for light blue and dark blue, which English doesn't, but Russian does and Italian does, you'll tend to treat those two colors as different the way English speakers treat pink and red as different colors. I don't think it means that we're physically incapable of perceiving the difference between different reds, because obviously we do do this all the time. It's just that it kind of facilitates our thinking in a particular direction because we're we're used to associating one group of things versus another group of things. So I think yeah. that linguistic relativity effects that you get tend to be very small and tend to be in the direction of other types of cultural associations and cultural priming. So there's an analogy that John McWhorter uses, which is if you feel more serious in a tuxedo than you feel in a clown suit, (laughs) this doesn't mean that the clown suit is affecting your thoughts. It means you have these associations with what wearing like a red nose and big shoes and like a, you know, multicolored wig is that are different from your associations with wearing like a tuxedo. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. One of the things that I found interesting about the interviews with the you know movie creators is they were really proud of themselves for having gotten the words nonlinear orthography into a Hollywood movie, because that's kind of technical. But this idea is that the alien language, at least the written one, is produced in such a way that you have to know what the whole sentence is as it is kind of spurting out in your like inkblot sort of way. Yeah. So because the aliens are producing language nonlinearly, they're also thinking nonlinearly about the whole world. And I don't know if I buy this connection. I think that was one of the weak points to me that the alien language would truly be nonlinear because it just looks to me like it's written in a circle, but it still has like parts to it. Yeah, I definitely had a more weavy visualization when I read the short story. It's more about the kind of meshing together of different bits. And in the short story, I got the idea that, so let's say you have an, uh, a sentence in Heptapod that's like, um, I see the dog. So, you know, three words ostensibly. Um, and that the part that meant dog might exist in like five different spots. Yeah. And the part that meant see might exist in five different spots. Yeah. So it would be kind of distributed. Yeah. Weavy. Partly this is the case because it would be truly difficult for humans to come up with a very, very, very nonlinear language. And so we end up just doing a linear language and putting it in a circle. If people liked this film, what else could they see or read to tickle their linguist 
interest or their linguistic sci-fi interest. I think my top recommendation for people who like The Rival would be Embassy Town. And this is a book by China Mieville. I don't know how you pronounce that person's name, actually. I say China Mieville. Mieville. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce French words in English. (laughs) I speak too much French. Uh, So this is a book. It's sci-fi-ish. It's set on a different planet. There are characters who are responsible for figuring out the language and stuff. It does have this like alien language plus thought thing, which is like a fun sci-fi thought experiment the same way that Faster Than Light is a fun sci-fi thought experiment. Sci-fi that plays around with linguistics tends to come back to linguistic relativity just because it, it is a really compelling thing to play around with. So Babel 17 is a book by Samuel Delaney that kind of also plays around with this trope of learning another language liberates your brain from the constraints of these boring and linear human languages, but in a much more classically sci-fi kind of way like snow crash is also quite similar that's a snow crash is definitely neil stevenson and that's more of the neurolinguistic programming suzette hayden elgin's native tongue is another book that has linguistic relativity as a central theme but also looks at this kind of through language and gender and she created a constructed language around which the plot in her book is based and you can learn that language independent of reading the book but the book is kind of the world in which the language is is used and used as a tool to change the way people think so that's another possible read otherwise just reading the original short story by ted chang the story of your life that arrival is based yeah i would definitely recommend the short story it gives a much more nuanced view of the kind of mundane realities of field work rather than the high drama of the film yeah it's less dramatic it has more field work and more physics in it there are very few sci-fi films where you're like wow i'm really glad that the linguistics got a better run than the physics yeah yeah it was it was refreshing to see more linguists than physics in the film yeah. i've heard that physicists are also tolerably pleased about it because the physicist nowhere wears a white coat right <laughs> And doesn't, like, sit in the lab with coloured beakers and pour one into the other. Done amazing things for geeks everywhere. There's a there's quite a good interview on, what's it called? Television versus Science, I think. It's a new YouTube channel that mm. uh, did an interview with a bunch of different creators, including Jessica Kuhn and Amy Adams and the real physicists in this. And so they talked about physics representation as well. But I think one of the things that's really exciting for linguists about this film is that there have been, you know, language related short stories and novels that play with linguistics ideas. But if you look at the pantheon of linguistic cinema, I mean, what is there, Lauren? There's like My Fair Lady and Star Trek. That's about it. That's always So got. My Fair Lady, you have Henry Higgins, who is a phonologist. He does analyze different dialects. He can tell where someone's from based on how they talk, which is moderately realistic. But he's also kind of a jerk. He is very a jerk. The whole thing is deeply uncomfortable about class and power and gender. Yeah, he's really, you know, pretentious and, and snobbish about the right way of speaking English and training the flower girl, Eliza Doolittle, into speaking correctly so that she can get a job, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. He's also a misogynist. So he's not a very pleasant guy. And so having that be the linguist that's the best known movie linguist is, you know, Amy Adams' character, Louise Banks, is a vast improvement over that. Definitely. Before we wrap up, what is your geekiest thought about I'm going to let you go first. From a, like, interactional and cognitive perspective, by far the weirdest thing about the aliens, the heptapods, is that they didn't point. Mm. They had seven bloody hands, tentacle Mm. finger things. The closest you get is when they tap on the glass to let her know that the bomb is about to go off. Then they splat on the glass, but there's no pointing. You know, we don't have many things we feel comfortable saying are, like, a universal hallmarks of human communication. But we're yet to find a human society where people don't point or understand pointing. It may vary between cultures in terms of frequency and whether people use certain fingers or their lips or whatever, but pointing and being able to perceive what a point means seems to be a fundamental part of human cognition and can be used by a variety of other animals. It's one of the ways that domesticated dogs are different from wolves, apparently, is that dogs are much better at following pointing. Okay, so you think if we were to meet an intelligent species, it would have to understand pointing? No, I just think it would have made those interactions that we didn't see because there were some nice montages trying to figure out, like, exactly what things were. You know, Louise and Ian point at themselves and they're like, Louise, I'm Louise. But the the creatures don't point at themselves. Mm. Yeah, that's true. So it's, it's not clear if they understand pointing or if they don't understand pointing and they figured it out some other way. But yeah, that was definitely my like, hmm, yeah. moment. I think my geekiest thing was wondering why. So we do see later in the film, there's this, you know, kind of time travel paradox, not quite time travel, but like future flash forward paradox where she learns information in the future that she needs in the past. 
Yeah. So in that case, if the heptapods know that in 3,000 years they're going to need the assistance of humanity, then presumably they already actually understand human language, at least some parts of human language or some of the human languages, maybe not English, but like they're walking in and it's not a monolingual fieldwork situation for them. It's only a monolingual fieldwork situation for the human. Well, maybe it would have been utterly impossible if they didn't have that. Yeah, I mean, so maybe this is what made it possible, right? So when Louise says humans and then it, human and it turns out they give her a logogram that means human, they can only do that because they actually do understand what she says. So this is what makes the, the fast montage of 10 days actually realistic, because if you were a, an actual field worker doing this with no language in common, you'd have a bunch of false starts where you'd assume they were saying human, but they were actually saying their word that meant person or something like that. Or maybe they don't make a distinction between human and person, maybe those are the same. Like there's a bunch of different potential ambiguities that you could have. So maybe this is what makes the 10 day field work situation possible. But you just think that if they are able to perceive time, then why not just turn up with a phrase book ready to go? Yeah, like, why not show up with a dictionary? Like, hey, here, guys, we made you some flashcards. Or we're just going to talk English like the aliens in Star Trek. Yeah. The reason that I came to after thinking about this for a while was that maybe what they wanted was... They didn't just want to be able to talk to humanity, they wanted to be able to like influence. First of all, they needed to be able to teach humans their language and you make a better case for learning the language if it seems like the aliens can't speak yours. Because the point is they wanted to be able to make the humans see in the future as well and so on and so forth. And secondly, that they wanted to screen for a very particular type of person to be their primary contact. And they wanted to screen for, you know, a linguist or at least someone who cares about communication and can figure out how to do this sort of monolingual fieldwork elicitation and isn't just, you know, a military person who's going to run in there with guns ablaze, you know, so they wanted to have a more meditative experience with the humans uh, where they, they were able to, to talk back and forth more. That was the conclusion I ultimately came to, but it did make me wonder. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things that we talked about in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. You can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and all the social networks. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. And I can be found at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Thanks to our producer, Claire. Our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! <laughs>